Yo guys, welcome to the last lap. Don't forget to drop a lovely juicy five star rating if you're watching an Apple podcast or Spotify. Hope you enjoy and let's get into it. What is the skill set that you need to be a really good team manager in, in, in esports, I mm. guess, to start with? Well, the, the number one thing you do actually as any kind of manager, mm. but like whether you're in esports or whatever, you, you're primarily like you have to be a people person. Um, and like literally the job is genuinely like you're just having to speak to people, get to know them. You have to be their friend. And if you're not like if you don't genuinely get on with them, you're not going to be a good manager because you have to like understand mm. like what people are going through. Um, and, you know, Lucas and Barry, the drivers on the face of it, th th those are exactly who you'd normally ask about. And, and to cut to the chase, they, they're all legends. Yeah, they're really easy to get on with. Nice guys. They're really working hard. And, you know, it's, it's great. But then it's, it's easy to overlook the fact that actually like behind them, you've got like development drivers, which are typically like younger esports people that are wanting to help and contribute, but they're not quite at the level themselves to like compete on the world stage. So you have to look after these people and managing their expectations and keeping them hungry mm -hmm. and willing to help, but not like burning their like desire to be there and get jealous mm. is that that could happen i would be jealous if i was a development <laughs> driver um and then you've also got people that aren't driving but more like people wanting to pursue more professional well i say more professional but more like kind of uh, logistical roles like management or traditional roles traditional yeah. roles exactly and you've got people that want to become managers themselves whether that's like kind of we call it engineers in esports and it, and it very much is an engineering role where you look at data and stuff but it's also a like because it's esports and it's newer people have to do a lot more mm -hmm. and so they're typically looking after people themselves and giving people pointers on you know how they're doing their job and then also looking after them as people you know it, there's a lot to it and mm. i don't think a lot of people really understand but mm. soon i think they will and and uh, you know hopefully even being here um is, is testament to that so there's a lot going on well how, how close is it to your equivalent at say the the equivalent um, position at the McLaren Formula One team versus your position last year as team manager for the McLaren esports team. Mm. Like, how, how similar are those roles? Well, I th like obviously I'm I'm much more qualified to talk about the esports side than than make too many presumptions about what what it's like on the F1 team. But I think uh, when I was so when I was working with McLaren last year. The best example of that was um, we bought in new to last year one of the F1 engineers that, that's um, working on the race strategy last year. He's actually since gone up in the ranks, and I'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a bit. But a guy called George Simmons, really good, good mate of mine now, and he was um, I put him as the head of engineering, so head of kind of data and strategy at McLaren Shadow, their esports team, and. Um, to be honest, I think from having George there, who was an engineer and from the F1 team to come into esports, it really like shone a light on actually they're very similar. Like they're very similar. And in many ways, it's like the esports team is, even though it's virtual and yes, it's a game or whatever, it's like a really good kind of training ground, if you like, um, you know, to actually prepare for real life motorsport. And the same also can be said, this is slightly top, uh, off topic, but the same is said for driving because obviously like Lucas Blakely is phenomenal in a car and then he go uh, phenomenal on a sim and then he goes in real life and he goes and beats Sebastian Vettel, Valtteri Bottas and all the others in, in, um, in the race of champions. So there's a lot of like, there's a lot of crossover like on all kind of sides of it. And you never know, maybe, um, maybe esports could become more of a recognized kind of proving ground for this stuff. I was going to I was actually going to ask that because like, from the driver perspective, because like you said, at race champions, Lucas Blakely, I think surprised pretty much everyone by beating really, really established F1 names like Seb and like Valtteri. Obviously, we've had a couple esports drivers go into the, the real life equivalent like Chem um, going off. He's in Super Formula now or the equivalent of. Yeah, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Braga. Um, Jan Mardenbra, who's getting his own movie. Yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Um, are there any drivers currently on the grill that you've worked with that you think will make the crossover like they did? Um, well, it's interesting. So last week, 
uh, Tom and I were at a karting event, mm -hmm. and actually on one of one of the teams I was I was with um, was Jan Mardenborough. Mm -hmm. I've never met him before, and kind of loosely meeting him and thinking about his story, it's amazing to me. With like he's he's obviously hugely talented. And so many of these drivers are, but I think it's people like Jan and Igor and, and everyone else that's made it full time. They, they've managed to like acquire like a kind of behind the scenes financial element to it or sponsorship mm. or backing. And I think that ironically, um, there's like loads of people that I think could make it in, mm. in real motorsport. Um, like James Baldwin is a prime example, you know, yeah. of he's massively fast. He's even proved himself. Um, but yeah, like you need that financial backing behind the scenes, otherwise nothing can happen. Yeah. So, uh, it, again, it's, it's a big, a big topic for debate, but I think basically, um, the challenge, and I think James, James is the best current example. Mm. It's a case of once you've got decent, what well, once you've got very good speed, it's then a case of, you know, hold that in your, that pocket and now focus on all efforts and getting sponsorship. But that's really really hard yeah so mm -hmm. it's test it's even more testament to those that have made it yeah. um so I, I'm, I'm trying to think how like you know gaming is so monetizable right there's a clear way of it's not just you know you're not just being monetized at the point of purchasing the game whether it's the f1 game whether it's a set of course or whatever it is right whether it's hardcore sim or more casual and then there's so many mechanics built into video games now obviously fifa is like a prime example and the amount of money that generates gaming is a very profitable industry motorsport is the polar opposite Motors motorsport is reliant so, so much of motorsport is reliant on just rich people who just love it mm. and just inject money into it and don't really see a return of investment it's very you know f1 is getting closer to profitability with it with these teams but even then that's reliant on prize money which is reliant on eyeballs do you think that you know having these two worlds come together will almost make the future of motorsport and what we see, you know, F1 drivers in the future, real life drivers, a bit more equitable because you can hone your skills on the simulator. You can, and maybe the games could, uh, you know, whether it's the F1 game, whether it's, you know, top tier sims like iRacing and Saddle Corsa could do, I guess, more to, to get, you know, because they're so close. They're so closely linked to the sim and the real thing. So do you think that's, again, I suppose it's, we want it to be more of a meritocracy, real life motorsport and esports kind of is much more of a meritocracy, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Uh, funnily enough, when I was on the way to the karting last week that, that we saw each other at Tom, um, one of the, I, I was driving there with one of the young, uh, well, with, with a young lad who I'm actually, he's part of a team that I'm working with through my business at the moment. And he, um, he made a really interesting point that he had been told because he's actually a racing driver, but he does sim racing. And he says, someone, some wise man, I can't actually remember who, who told it, but <laughs> it was um, that by doing sim racing, you can make money. And then by doing real racing, you just lose spend money. money. Yeah, yeah, you just spend money. And it's like, actually, like when yeah. you, when you just rip apart all the kind of like different things of thinking about it, it's like, actually, it's probably just as simple as that. It's just, if you're part of sim racing, you know, you, there is a job there, but then real racing there isn't. And may, maybe, you know, I'm not really too sure what to think of that, to be honest. I think that it's just reflective of what the industries are like, but mm. you know, um, on the plus side, perhaps that's actually a huge like core opportunity of esports there in that. Like, I think it is. Yeah. 